There's a scene in the American Girl doll book Good Luck Ivy where the titular character Ivy Ling flips through some magazines with her white friend Julie when suddenly they are confronted with an image of a Chinese girl that accompanies an article about communism. Ivy reflects on how in American media, the little representation of girls who look like her are almost always linked to the communist threat and how there's almost no East Asian women wearing the latest hairstyles or fashion trends in the pop culture magazines the girls her age enjoy. In other words, communist Chinese kids being the main representation of Chinese children in the U.S., her home, immediately makes her feel othered. Sure, there's Connie Chung and Bruce Lee as Ivy's story takes place during the 70s, but their fame and visibility alone cannot defeat the U.S.'s long history of xenophobia and racism. And I remember reading this as a kid and finding it extremely relatable even though I was growing up and coming of age in the late 2000s and early 2010s. The North Korean spy joke was very much a thing in high school, both in popular media like The Big Bang Theory and in my real life. Okay, what does that have to do with Joyce Kim? As it turns out, she was a North Korean spy. Every day in my French class, there was this Korean American student who was bullied mercilessly by this other kid who constantly <laughs> asked him if he was from North Korea. China as the enemy went out of fashion somewhat as I got older and the attention moved to North Korea. But in the end, all of us East Asian kids were lumped together. It didn't matter where we were from, the bullying he got made the rest of us know we weren't welcome. And as a kid, I wondered where this stereotype came from. Like I knew from a very young age that China was a communist country, or at least working its way there as no country is 100% communist, but rather socialist working towards a communist end goal. And I actually have this distinct memory of asking my mom what communism even was and her saying that it's when everyone shares everything but it doesn't really work. Okay, well that clears that up, thanks mom. And it'd be really easy to chalk up these pervasive stereotypes that all East Asian people are spies for the communist government on just US propaganda and straight up racist portrayals of Chinese people in American media, but I think it's also a little more subtle than that. It's not just the lack of quantity of positive representation in Hollywood or even the long history of yellow face and pigeonholing East Asian actors either, but also how even in so-called unbiased news and documentary footage, they too quietly reinforce, at least in the US, that Chinese people and East Asian people, no matter where they're from, are other. Good Luck Ivy touches on this well in that even in objective news stories that have no agenda and are just reporting on life, they can still make you feel othered. Like here's a breaking news story out of China or a documentary about the real North Korea, and then me as an East Asian person just has to think, great, here's yet another thing that might be used against me. But in some ways, this fear of the Chinese or communist threat only made me more curious about what all the fuss was for. Additionally, because there was so little East Asian American media for me growing up, most of the representation I had was in documentaries and the news or in foreign language films that just so happened to cover the more negative aspects of these societies. There was a long time in my adolescence where I primarily saw people who looked like me or who had a similar life experience as me through the lens of news footage and documentaries, particularly Al Jazeera's 101 East series on YouTube and later Vice Asia. Whether they were about interracial kids or international adoption or about the North Korean mass games, I watched them because I found comfort in seeing other kids who looked like me, even if they lived on the other side of the globe. I personally became very invested in knowing the truth about how communism, the truth about my own supposed people. I read books like The Red Scarf Girl, watched movies like To Live and Farewell My Concubine, and documentaries like A State of Mind. And through my journey of consuming media about the reality of North Korea or China in particular, either by insiders or outsiders, I've come across some very humanizing and humbling stories. Three of them I'd like to share with you today. The first is A State of Mind from 2004 that follows two gymnasts preparing for the mass games in North Korea and the latter two are relatively new. One Child Nation from 2019 deals with the reality of the one child policy in China and American Factory from 2020 investigates the Chinese company Fu Yao Glass and reverse outsourcing in that the Chinese are now outsourcing work to the US rather than vice versa. In this video, I'd like to discuss them and their themes. And if you haven't already seen these documentaries, this is your chance. A State of Mind can be found on the very valuable internet archive as well as here on YouTube. One Child Nation is on Amazon and American Factory is on Netflix. So without further ado, let's go.
So I got this comment on my last video, you should do another video called Children Under Communism as I guess a joke, but here I am actually attempting to talk a little about that. Firstly, as I stated in the intro, no country has ever really achieved pure communism, but rather follows socialist politics in order to reach that goal. So even countries like North Korea, depicted in the 2004 documentary A State of Mind, directed by British documentarian Daniel Gordon, isn't a communist state, but rather a totalitarian dictatorship under a cult of personality, particularly Kim Jong-il. In the documentary, Gordon and his team followed two girls, 13-year-old Hyun Sun Park and 11-year-old Song Yeon Kim, for eight months leading up to the mass games, a social realistic spectacle where single-minded unity is reached, where one gives up their individuality to the collective and to commemorate their dear leader. The games are a way for the ruler to enforce the submission of his subjects, but it's also fun for the artists involved who love their craft and who look forward to the event each year. The games feature 100,000 participants, many of them young school-aged children alongside adults in a 90-minute display of gymnastics, dance, acrobatics, as well as theatrical plays accompanied to music. One of the most mesmerizing moments in the games are the synchronized backdrops prepared by 12,000 school children. The child acrobats are another highlight of the show, of course. Song Yun is only 11 years old, but has performed in two mass games prior to the documentary, and in 2003 was placed in the second row. No small feat. And these kids work from dusk till dawn, starting 10 weeks out from the games with a two-hour lunch break. In the months prior, they work for two hours each day, and the best in the class are chosen for the final performance, which will be presented to Kim Jong-il. Hyun Sun has performed for him three times before and calls it her greatest achievement. Unfortunately, in 2003, he was unable to attend the show. And though the mass games are the highlight of the documentary and its climax, what I find more interesting is just watching the daily lives of these two kids and learning about life in Pyongyang, a city of 2 million people. According to Gordon, North Korean society is split into three classes, the workers, the peasants, and the intellectuals, with all being seen as equals. The country's capital, Gordon says, is not demonstrative of real North Korean life, but it instead is a showcase capital where housing is distributed by the state, and the city's population is privileged and fortunate enough to have been chosen to live there. Housing is allocated by the state. Pyongyang is not representative of North Korea. It is the showcase capital. For its two million residents, it's considered a privilege to live here. Hyun Sun's family is part of the working class and lives in a two-bedroom apartment with her grandmother and grandfather as well as her parents. Her father is a driver for the government and her grandfather is a construction worker. Song Yun lives with her parents and two older sisters in a slightly better apartment as her father is a physics professor at the university and they even have a pet dog. And despite just 30 miles outside of the capital where the peasants are suffering, we instead step inside the shoes of these two kids and see the country through their eyes. We see them at gymnastics practice where they train outside with no mat to break their fall, spend time with their family during holidays, and experience the sacred Mount Pektu and witness them just being kids waiting in the water laughing and making memories. We're able to view North Korea through the privileged eyes of upper class children, but we also don't miss out on the fact that the lower classes outside Pyongyang live vastly different lives. But I personally think that the documentary not focusing on the suffering of the masses is an important distinction. To see people genuinely happy in North Korea, especially children, that's what draws us in as outsiders. Really, people just live there and go about their lives, even kids? It seems unimaginable. And I'm sure some people will watch this documentary and think they're all just brainwashed and we need to save them from themselves. But I personally think that's what the documentary is trying to fight against. Rather than trying to show how unhappy everyone is and how we should all pity them and try to rescue them, it shows that they're just people and even dares to show some positives of living under an isolationist state. For example, North Korea is the only country that closed its borders entirely during the SARS outbreak in Asia. This isn't to say that they don't show polarizing political images, especially anti-US propaganda, and the narration does mention how disturbing it is that everyone must fond over this one guy. But they do a good job overall at just humanizing the greater populace, rich and poor, young and old, and also showing how kind of awesome the mass games 
are and how dedicated and talented the performers are. In the end, I think it would have been an easy way out to just go along with the already established narrative that North Korea and its people are brainwashed robots, but instead the documentary works to challenge our preconceived notions for the better. This isn't to say that North Korea is good actually, because no, it's not. And yes, I am aware that these people could be lying in order to just make it to the next day as this documentary was watched by the North Korean censors. But despite all that, I think it's really important that this documentary shows North Koreans aren't a monolith, that they are not the evil other, they're just people. It's especially important to show US audiences this as we're so used to seeing and hearing jokes about North Korean spies, how they're this evil threat to our freedom and how just awful they and their country are. In addition, we're so used to being portrayed as the good guys, as the heroes, without ever really reflecting on how we in the U.S. benefit from imperialism and colonialism, and how in a lot of ways we do deserve the backlash we face abroad for terrorizing the rest of the world. I also think that through the mass games, we in the U.S. are able to see how silly our own patriotism and nationalism is in comparison. We might gawk at the spectacle to our dear leader, but we have the same intensely patriotic PS in our own country. Whether it's rapping about the founding fathers, or post 9-11 music or the obscenity that is Mount Rushmore, not to mention the U.S. Army being the largest polluter in the world. I mean, we're no better in comparison when it comes to all that. So why do we find them so evil, so different, and so other? We'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. Similarly, through the documentary, we learn that the way we treat children under capitalism and in North Korea isn't so different either. Under both systems, children are only useful in the ways they can serve the state, either by getting a job and being put to work in service of the economy, or being put to train for hours a day in order to support and promote their love of the government. Children are exploited throughout the world for their labor, and if they can't give that, then what's the point? If they just want to hang out with their friends, what's the good in that when they could be making money or participating to perform for the general? In one instance, Hyun Sun talks about how she skipped gymnastics class to just play around with her friends and when her parents and teacher found out they weren't happy to say the least. In both the US and North Korea, kids are told to just grow up already and start working because that's when you can start being useful and the more mature you are at the younger the age, the better. Which is why 11 year old Songyun is the star of the show, she's talented beyond her years, so she gets pushed to the front as a sign that more kids should be like her. It's hard to really talk about North Korea even when discussing documentaries that claim to be unprecedentedly truthful because there really is no way of us knowing if what you're seeing is real and how much you know we all should believe. How much should you take with a grain of salt? Are people really happy there? And I guess that's up to you as the viewer, but I do think that it's important to continue to humanize the people from North Korea and I'm glad that the documentary does that. So to talk further about children under communism, One Child Nation was released on PBS and Amazon and centers around the one child policy. It's a 360 degree view of the impact of the policy, the victims, survivors, and those who work to enforce it. The story is told by Nan Fu Wang, a filmmaker from Jiangxi province in China who's also American. She recently had a son and thus this life event prompts her to go back to her roots and find out more about what it was like in China for parents and children under this policy. And though she thought that she remembered the one child policy so clearly as she was taught it from birth, as an adult she came to realize how little she actually knew about it. It. The one-child policy in China started in 1979 and ended in 2015. It was enacted in order to stop China's population boom, which according to the government threatened China's economy and the environment, etc. Supposedly, 300 million births were prevented due to this rule. The law was that each family could only have one child, but that they could have another child after five years and after paying a fine of 500 USD or 4,000 yuan. This is what Nanfu's family did. Nanfu even talks about how she felt different from her classmates for having a sibling while they were all only children. 
And though the policy was more readily accepted in urban areas where money was more concentrated, sex education was more prevalent, and where children weren't an integral part of the workforce, in rural areas like where Nanfu's family was from, it was harder to enforce. In 1989, Nanfu's uncle abandoned a baby at a market, and after three days, she died, as they were not able to afford her, thus showing the class disparity of this law. He says in the documentary that he was pushed to do this by his own mother, who threatened to kill herself and the baby. Nanfu's mother helped him abandon the baby and convinced him to try again for a boy, as boys in China are cherished and seen as a part of the immediate family, while girls marry out and are seen as part of the extended family. Nanfu even says how she has no photos of her grandfather and her, but her brother has plenty. Paradoxically, kids of all genders are needed as part of the labor force in rural areas, which is why the law was so hard to enforce outside of major cities. Even girls are valued for the work they can do in service of the family. For example, after Nanfu's father died at the young age of 33, she was put to work, while her brother got to study and money was put aside for him and his higher education. Nanfu went to a vocational school and helped take care of him. Nanfu's aunt on her father's side also abandoned a baby girl, but gave her away to a human trafficker who sold her to an orphanage. When asked if the aunt regrets what she did or not, or if her mother regrets helping her brother abandon her niece for dead, they both say no, and fully believe that the one-child policy saved China. And unsurprisingly, they're not alone. Many of the older generation who lived under and enforced this policy have the same impression. One family planning official who was a midwife, Shu Qingjiang, performed hundreds of born-alive abortions, where the mothers were induced at 8 or 9 months and the babies would be killed alive. She ended up being a highly decorated midwife due to the fact that in her territory, birth rates were always low. She started this work at 19. Xu Tsing said that though at first the work was tough, to say the least, to see pregnant women crying, screaming, and even trying to run away, policy was policy and they were at war. <laughs> She and others truly believe that by killing these babies and forcing women to get abortions and be sterilized, they were saving the country. Peng Wong, an artist, says that this is all because of early indoctrination. How else do teenage girls go about the business of killing other women's babies? Tying the women down, hearing them scream and sob, the only way to cope with it is to rationalize that they have no choice, that the party is infallible, and that this is all for the greater good. However, a different midwife, Hua Ru Yuan, who claims to have performed 60,000 abortions and sterilizations along with deliveries and inductions, does feel awful about the work she did and has decided to help people with infertility issues become pregnant as a sort of atonement. But even still, she knows that retribution is coming and openly admits that she committed sins that can never be undone. But most people, even Nanfu's own family, give the same platitudes. It was unspeakable work. But that was the law. Rules are rules. In the end, Nanfu paints the one-child policy as a war against your own people, your own population. We are fighting a population war was a common slogan used by the government during the one-child policy. China started a war against population growth, but it became a real war against its own people. In the second half of the documentary, Nanfu focuses on human trafficking and international adoption, which China started allowing in 1992. If the babies weren't killed or thrown in dumpsters, they were found and then human trafficked to orphanages and put up for international adoption. Nanfu as well as Longlan, a Chinese woman living in the U.S. with three adopted daughters from China, both talked to Duan and his family, who were ex-human traffickers and sentenced to six years in prison while his sister received 10 years. They would find babies and give them to the 
these state-run orphanages. And though we usually attribute negative feelings towards human trafficking, the documentary actually has us sympathize with them, as in some ways they were saving the babies from just dying on the side of the road. And by including Duan in his family's story, it makes the one-child policy out to be a class issue as well, in that his mother and his family felt so sorry for the babies because, like them, they were forgotten, poor, and helpless, unlike the greedy party officials who would be rewarded and praised for killing as many babies as possible. Duan's mother and sister claimed that they originally thought the orphanages were charitable institutions and wanted to help the babies, but it was the orphanages who offered them the money, and thus their business started. How much you want to believe this is up to you, but at least by giving them to the orphanages, they were saved from dying of starvation and sun exposure on the street. A lot of the babies trafficked to the orphanages as seen in Longland's photos were newborns when they were found, and thus without the orphanage and the people who brought them there, they surely would have perished within days, much like Nan Fu's uncle's daughter. Later, it is discovered by Jiao Ming Peng, an exiled journalist in Hong Kong, that Chinese party officials as recent as 2011 were raiding poor rural villages and taking babies to be sold to orphanages for international adoption, not only for money, but to fill the party's demands and quotas and to terrorize the impoverished community as an act of power. One family lost their three-and-a-half-month-old baby who was kidnapped by party officials. They tried to hide, but they were caught. In all, Peng says that around 20 babies from one village were kidnapped in this manner. The exploitation of the most vulnerable class, the poor and children, is a huge part of the story that cannot be ignored. The documentary estimates that there's 130,000 Chinese adoptees worldwide and that the stories the orphanages give are most likely made up and that most of the adoptees were either trafficked by poor people and sold to orphanages or worse yet, kidnapped and forcibly put up for adoption by the government, but it's almost impossible to know the entire truth. And if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I'm adopted from China, so this documentary had a huge impact on me. In many ways, being adopted because of the one-child policy feels like survivor's guilt, like surviving a war. I sometimes can't help but wonder about all of those who died and didn't make it. Mong's documentary came out at an interesting time because just a few years later, in 2021, Found premiered on Netflix, a documentary that focuses on three Chinese-American girls adopted from China because of the one-child policy. I'm not going to get into that documentary specifically, but I do recommend watching it as a double feature with One Child Nation. To end the documentary, Nanfu talks about how in the U.S. at the time in 2017 and 2018, Roe v. Wade was still being debated, and how starkly that contrasts with the one-child policy enforced Abortions. I'm struck by the irony that I left a country where the government forced women to abort, and I moved to another country where governments restrict abortions. On the surface, they seem like opposites, but both are about taking away women's control of their own bodies. And this highlights a debate on how much the government should be involved in family planning and population control, how women should have the right to choose what happens to their bodies, and how you can't wage a war against your own people because look how that turns out. Now there's a lack of women in China, which threatens the future of their population, which could reduce by half within a hundred years because Chinese women don't want to have more children and don't want to get married in general. Men thus blame women for being too picky or too career focused, etc. Sound familiar? You can't implement a policy that directly discriminates against the female population and then turn around and blame them for not being open to relationships with the same men who've been favored and literally chosen over them for decades. Now, there's a two-child push in China that's not so much a policy, but just an ideal in order to keep up the population standard. In all, children under Chinese socialism aren't treated much better. They're still seen as pawns, as objects to be controlled, as little workers. As we know, China does partake in child labor, and American companies also outsource their labor to Chinese children. In all, the one-child policy was a brutal, bloody struggle where no one came out unscathed or untouched, and I applaud the documentary and Nanfu Wang for taking a strong stand against it, while also humanizing the subjects and trying to understand the rationale behind it, even though it still doesn't make much sense.
So I've talked about how much I love American Factory in previous videos, but now I really want to get into it. American Factory is a 2020 Netflix documentary that was produced in part by Obama's production company, Higher Ground Productions. It centers on billionaire Cao De Wong and his company, Fu Yao Glass, which produces glass for cars and other automobiles. Cao's newest project is to open up a factory in the US, specifically in Moraine and Dayton, Ohio, where an old GM plant was located. Cao opens up two operations there and employs both American and Chinese workers. The Chinese workers are housed by the company and one employee says that Cao promises to bring his family over if he stays at the plant for two years without seeing them, a promise that is kept as seen in the ending of the documentary. The main theme of the documentary is culture clash as the US workers and Chinese workers go head to head as they see their jobs in very different lights. For the Chinese workers who were transplanted to the US without knowing English, this job is everything to them. They need to succeed in order for for their American dream to come true. Thus, they dedicate themselves entirely to the company and submit. They know that this is a once in a lifetime chance that they'll never get back. And therefore, they're okay with subpar pay and working conditions, putting themselves in danger and not adhering to safety codes, etc. For the American workers, it's a different story. The American workers to their Chinese bosses are seen as entitled and soft for wanting to follow safety protocol, asking for more rest time, etc. This all comes to a head when it's time to unionize and the Chinese higher-ups win by promising a $2 raise. Hourly employee in this room, whatever you pay today, $2 more. They fire the older employees who know their rights and hire younger, more inexperienced American workers who just need the money and will ask less questions. These young people got scared. Them LRI people scared the shit out of them. That's all. It's honestly truly sad to see a lot of the union organizers suffer because so many of the other workers, aka their competition, is okay with subpar conditions and aren't as entitled. But in the end, that's what capitalism does to us. It turns worker solidarity into competition where I have to beat you for this position and to do so, I have to give up my rights to put food on the table. But workers should be entitled, Chinese or American, outsourced, labor or domestic. Everyone should be compensated fairly, but that's rarely the case when billionaires want to stay billionaires and don't care if their own employees are homeless. The most impactful moments of the documentary for me though, outside of the factory politics, was how honestly welcoming the Americans were to the Chinese non-English speaking workers. They invited them into their homes and even showed them their guns. They had seemingly fun with each other and laughed with one another rather than at one another. This American worker who threw a big Thanksgiving Day bash for the Chinese workers sadly ended up losing his job though for being too slow after just two years at the company. Though in the end he says that he wouldn't trade that time for anything as he made a lot of friends at the plant, specifically talking about Wong, his fellow furnace engineer. I wouldn't take away for the last two and a half years. I met a lot of good friends and I learned a lot from the Chinese. Another interesting part of the documentary is when the U.S. higher-ups are invited to China and go to this Fu Yao banquet with a theatrical play dedicated to the company and Cao De Wong, the glorious founder. One employee breaks down in tears at how beautiful the display of corporate patriotism is, though he probably was just drunk. Another American worker who speaks Chinese makes an off-color joke to a Chinese overseer that honestly is just really awkward. He's talking to him about how much more efficient the Chinese employees are compared to those in Dayton and says that he wishes he could put duct tape over their mouths because that would make their production higher. And the Chinese supervisor just stares at him like this is what you think is going on here. <laughs> To many of the Chinese workers in China, many of them really do play their part well and truly believe and dedicate themselves to their jobs. Many of them don't see it as torture compared to how Americans view their jobs. As Wong puts it, workers have pride. Even though their jobs are tough and dangerous, they're like railroad tracks, making sure the train goes in the right direction. 我们就像公司里面的一个一个就是一个在铺铺导轨的人一样，那下面呢，我车里要我开。so for this American guy to make such a crude remark about treating workers badly, it's a little gauche because generally that's not how the Chinese workers and leaders view themselves as purposefully torturing themselves and others, but rather as trying to accomplish a common goal. 
And even if they did agree with the guy, it would be a little mean to agree with that and vulgar to say the quiet part out loud. Later in the documentary, a Chinese supervisor in Ohio makes an off-color joke that the Americans should complete mandatory overtime on Sunday like the Chinese employees do. And no one laughs because again, even if we agree, we don't say the quiet part out loud. Instead, what we should do is just play into the facade that we love the company and the workers. And many do genuinely believe in the company and that the workers truly do love their jobs. So to the rest of the employees in the meeting, making that kind of comment about how much the job sucks is just rude and nonsensical because their jobs don't suck, right? Either way you see it, as the workers being brainwashed by propaganda, truly believing in the cause, or just going along with it, each of the options contrasts starkly with the American workers who don't take part in that corporate BS. American workers don't play their part because they know how vital they are, and in part, I think that's one reason why American companies like Ford and GM left to outsource in other countries like China and Mexico, where the working law is less rigid and the environmental protections easier to skirt around. And that's part of the irony of the documentary. The American workers romanticize their time at GM without realizing that the same company went elsewhere to exploit other people because they couldn't exploit you. Though recently, this past October, the UAW won in Detroit against GM for better working conditions. Part of the resentment of Fu Yao for the Americans is because they're being treated like they're Chinese. And in so many ways, many U.S. workers are fine with the exploitation of developing nations for their own consumer products, but when they face that same treatment, they get angry. But the documentary doesn't shame the American workers for this oversight, but rather encourages this idea that workers all over the world should be just as entitled as American workers and rightfully so. Rather than companies spending $1 million on anti-union presentations, maybe use that same money to give your workers paid time off, sick leave, and an actual living wage, not $14 an hour, and the opportunity to win a trip to China that nobody wants. Well, except maybe this guy. One of your lucky guys, you're gonna see that city. Like I said, this one American supervisor really admires how much the Chinese workers just seem to shut up and do their job and is impressed at how much they can produce rather than seeing how exploited these people are. And in the end, that's the separation of labor from the means of production. The people who are your boss have no empathy for you because they know they'll never be you. They're not nor will ever be in community with you. It's like the police. They look down on the criminals they apprehend because they see them as such, as criminals, as thugs, as losers, not as other human beings. And that's all by design, to keep the ruling class as far as possible mentally and physically from those they oversee and control so the whole system can keep perpetuating itself, so no one reflects too hard on the role they play in keeping their fellow human beings down. In the end, American Factory is about how far American industry has fallen that now we're being outsourced for our labor. But rather than taking an anti-Chinese stance, it shows how workers need to work together and be entitled. And that Though American entitlement can be harmful at times when it comes to worker rights, it's vital. As a racial minority in the U.S., it's hard not only watching fictional caricatures of your race on TV or in film, but also just as painful watching the supposedly unbiased news and knowing that Real-world events done by people who simply look like you will impact your everyday life halfway around the world. From Kim Jong-un's crimes, Chinese school children bouncing basketballs in sync, to the Wuhan flu and the general red threat, all of it affects those in the diaspora, and I'm glad works like Good Luck Ivy and other well-done documentaries are able to shed some human light on the Chinese and North Korean people because we so rarely get that in U.S. media, fictional or otherwise. And in the U.S. is where we need it the most. I hope that after watching this video, you go out of your way to explore some of these documentaries further. Let me know what you think of them down below and what you think of this video. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.